Hello, everybody. This is Xin Yi. I hope everybody is okay during this pandemic. I have my colleague Pei and Jian Chen joined me today to talk about big data format and Uber data info. Just some brief introduction. Again, my name is Xin Yi Xiang. I'm Apache Pokui Community PMC Chair, and I work in Uber data info as a tech lead manager. Pei is a software engineer who has been working on Pokui area for the last couple of years. He worked on Pokui column encryption, key management service used by the column encryption. Jian Chen is a senior software engineer, also working in Uber Data Infer. Uh, he also working in the Pokui area. Uh, he has a lot of experience on the distributed system. Today, we organize our talk as this. First, let's have some brief introduction on Apache Pokui, just to set up the context for the following slides. Then we can briefly talk about inside Uber, how is our data format looks like, and how the Apache Pokui is used inside Uber. Then we move on to the data encryption, data masking talked by Jian Chen. We will show you how we apply column encryption to secure our data. And following that, Pei will talk about storage cost efficiency inside, inside the Pokui. We will show you how do we reduce the storage cost by millions of dollars by taking some innovations of Pokui. Finally, we will talk about our future paths in data format. Before we start, let's have a quick review of big data file format. There are many types of storage file format. In the data analytics world, it can be divided into two major categories, column and row storage. For column storage, they are mostly Apache Pokui and ORC. These file formats are used very widely by Spark, Hive, Presto, Iceberg, Delta Lake, Hoodie, etc. In today's talk, we mainly focus on Apache Pokui. Let's zoom in Apache Pokui for a little bit more details to build up the context. Pokui is a column storage file format again. The data in the same columns will be put together. That will make data analytics faster because they can retrieve those column data all together. Meanwhile, that makes the file size smaller because the value from the same column usually has a lot of similarities that will make the coding and compression more efficient. So this diagram shows the internal structure of Pokui file format. A Pokui file format is divided into the different row groups. And each row group is divided into the different column chunk. So each column has one column chunk inside that group. So each column chunk is further divided into pages. Each page is the unit for encoding, compression, and compression. This just gives you a brief concept of what Pokui looks like. In Uber Data Lake, we ingest data from upstream to Data Lake using ingesting pipelines and using ETL and machine learning jobs to translate this data. The upstream has the transactional data like Mexico, schema list, Cassandra, DB stores, et cetera. So we ingest the data through Kafka and use a hoodie as a table format. Some of you might know hoodie was born in Uber. It is one of the three table formats along with Esper and Data Lake. Hoodie supports incremental ingesting by absurd. The data format, the file format of hoodie Supported mainly is Pokui. For data analytics and the machine learnings, we translate the job that we already ingested into the data lake. After the translation, the data format could be Pokui or ORC, mainly Pokui. We have a small portion of the files are still ORC, but we are in the progress of converting them to Pokui. The typical use case is as following. So who the incremental ingestion with Pokemon format and Spark Presto reading with some optimization of the data. We have the Pokemon column encryption to secure the data. We also have the 
cost efficiency initiative to optimize the storage cost. In today's talk, we focus on the last two initiatives, pocket column encryption, storage size reduction at the pocket for cost efficiency. For now, I will hand it over to Jian Chen to talk about column encryption. Hello, everybody. So my name is Jian Chen Xu. So today I'm going to talk about column encryption and the companion feature called the data masking. Next slide, please. First, why do we need column encryption? Alternatively, we can always encrypt the whole data set at table level. We found these compelling reasons. So one, a typical data set only has a small percentage of columns that are actually confidential. Column encryption provides more fine-grained control over protecting your data. So secondly, column encryption opens up the data sets while still protecting data. We have more examples of that. Next slide, please. So uh, let's understand column encryption from an example. Column encryption provides column level access control. So we also call it CLAC. Without a CLAC, let's uh, look at a example table called employee. So I suppose it has a two sensitive fields, ID and email, and also other normal fields. So when we select ID email from this table, it will be blocked. We select a other non-sensitive columns A and B from employee table, it will also be blocked. With CLAC enabled with the column level access control, when you select a uh, sensitive columns ID and email, it will be blocked. But when you select A and B, other non-sensitive columns, it can succeed. So it blocks only personal da information data, but it allows non-PI data to go through. Next slide, please. Now let's drill down uh, into more details of column encryption, use cases, and implementation. So this is a typical big data stack. Data users, owners sitting on the top, they run business intelligence queries, machine learning use cases. In the middle is a different query engines, Hive, Presto, Spark, and applications. Storage is sitting at the bottom, the HDFS or file system. Next slide, please. So a big design challenge in big data and particularly for column encryption is we need to support these multiple access paths to HDFS. There are SQL queries, non-SQL, and direct from CLI from RPC calls. And also HDFS supports plain file, so there is no concept of column. Next slide, please. So uh, we need to, in order to support all these, a natural place is a, is a file format layer. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's at the lowest level, right uh, along the storage, HDFS and the OS. So, um, so typically, like we use Parquet ORC here. Next slide, please. So from a high level approach, we, this, we enforce control at the data format packet level, and we encrypt only sensitive columns in HDFS. We use a one key uh, according to sensitive level to do encryption and decryption. And uh, we, we store the, yeah, we provide access control through this key uh, managed key access in, in uh, KMS key management systems. Next slide, please. So this conceptual high level flow, we have writer side and the reader side. From the writer side, we have the parquet application that sends a plain data and also data we, we need to encrypt like C2 is plain data. And we send it together with encrypted metadata to parquet. The parquet lib will keep C1 as plain data, but the C2 will become encrypted data when it's written to the storage. On the reader side, the reader will see plain data and the encrypted data C2. We need to go through Parquet library and we need to request the keys to decrypt C2. So the application reader 
will get plain data, C1. And if a, it, it has a valid key as access, will get plain data, C2 decrypted, or it could be error. Or uh, next we'll talk about, it, it could be a uh, mask. Next slide, please. So uh, here we integrate with Spark, Hive, Presto. The first question we need to, uh, to answer is, how do we uh, mark which columns uh, that, a, that are sensitive and need to be encrypted. So one natural place we found is uh, to store this information with the schema. So there are uh, multiple layers. So first, uh, using Spark as an example, we, we store which columns are sensitive and need encryption in the, in the application schema. Spark, we have say encryption true as an example. And then we extend the different layers, extend the parquet write support as a plugin that will translate the metadata and uh, store the uh, key metadata into the parquet schema. And we also have a new crypto retriever that activates encryption and also was as a plugin that's used in the writer and the reader for the encryption and decryption. Next slide, please. So next, uh, now let's talk about the data masking. So what is data masking? It's a process of uh, obfuscating original data so that if a user tries to query a column without having access, it, it can still work. So why do we need the data masking? So it basically allows the user to continue to, to work, to do useful things without, uh, without a, having access to the, to the encrypted data improve the user experience of a column encrypt, encrypted tables. Next slide, please. So here we have uh, some different types of the masks. The most uh, simple one is a null mask. So when the user does not have permission to access some columns, we display nulls. There are uh, some more uh, advanced ones. Hash mask, we display some pre-computed hash values of the sensitive data if the user does not have permission. There are redact masks. We also is also a kind of predefined redacted data for user that when user has no permission. And also there are there are cases user can define his own mask. Next slide, please. So here is an example for the now mask, the most basic one. The advantage is is a very simple, the minimum data masking. Basically, when, when you have no access for some columns, you get nulls. So the, um, the, the advantage is that we need no packet writer changes to support it. It's just the reader, when we, when we see uh, you have no access, we just return now. So uh, the limitations is no joinability because uh, the data all becomes null, so you can't join. And also there is a possibility of confusion between real now and this mask now. Next, please. Okay, next I will hand over to pa Pavi to talk about the storage cost efficiency. Okay, thank you, Jinchen. Yeah, so now I'm gonna talk about storage cost efficiency. So what is the motivation uh, behind cost efficiency with Parquet? Uh, well, I think the main motivation is that we all know that da data grows very fast. Uh, especially at Uber, the data size is always growing and the storage and compute for large scale data is, 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 is expensive. Uh, additionally, big data queries can often be slow because of so much data. And this is sort of a cycle that always repeats as the data size grows, costs increase, and we're basically wasting money. So finding cost efficiency with Parquet is a way to mitigate this issue. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we pursued a bunch of different strategies for reducing storage size with Parquet. Uh, and I'll be touching on all these different strategies that we did with at Uber. And some of these include uh, high ratio compression, column pruning, column reordering, uh, decimal precision reduction, and efficient encoding. Uh, next slide. Uh, so let's talk about how to reduce data size in a file format particularly in Parquet. So at Uber, uh, Parquet dominates the, uh, the file formats in our data lake. There are a small portion of files which are in ORC, but the remaining is all Parquet. 
And the two main strategies that we used are encoding and compression to make data size smaller. And Parquet uh, supports a variety of these different mechanisms. For example, run length encoding, delta encoding, uh, snappy compression, gzip, Z standard. These are all different strategies that are available to us with Parquet and things that we'll explore in the next few slides. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about Z standard compression. Uh, so five years ago, Facebook published the Z standard compression, uh, which can over outperform the existing compression uh, like GZIP in terms of compression ratio and in terms of speed. Uh, by the way, compression ratio is the defined uh, is defined as the original data size uh, divided by the compressed data size. Basically, this means uh, the larger the ratio you have, the more your original data gets compressed. Uh, additionally, another parameter to keep in mind is this, the compression speed. And the speed is defined as how quickly you can compress or decompress the data. Uh, and in, on this slide, the example that we use uh, that's uh, shown is uh, measured in terms of millo, uh, megabytes per second. Uh, so the compression ratio and speed are usually a trade-off. Some compression ratio, uh, some compression libraries are optimized for compression ratio, but with very low speed. And some compression libraries are optimized for speed with very small ratio. And both GZIP and Z standard are generic compression. This means you can choose a trade off between the ratio and the speed. And in the chart on this slide, uh, we have both Z standard, which is in light blue, or which is in blue, and GZIP, which is in red. And we can see from this chart that uh, Z standard uh, beats uh, GZIP in both dimensions, both in terms of the ratio as well as the speed. And if you choose the same uh, amount of ratio, Z standard is faster at compressing at that ratio. And if you choose a certain speed, uh, compression speed, Z standard will uh, be able to reduce your data by much, much more. Uh, and on the right side, we see the speed of de uh, decompression uh, and Z standard still consistently outperforms GZIP. And in our own in-house experiments, we saw that we found a 10% drop in storage size when we translated from GZIP to Z standard. Next slide. Okay, so we did some in-house experiments when we translated our GZIP parquet files to Z standards. And this is basically what we did. We translated 65 uh, files from different tables and each uh, file was one gigabyte in size. And then for each file, uh, we tried different compression levels that are offered by the compression library. So Z standard offers 22 different compression levels. And the higher the level that you choose, the more uh, compression ratio that you get. But as we mentioned in the previous slide, there's a trade-off with speed. So as you go for higher compression ratios, the higher levels also come with a slower speed. And so we tested out all these different ratios on our own data uh, across a bunch of different tables. And on the right side, we saw that our, our own results on how the, the compression ratio uh, scaled in relation to the compression level that we chose. And then we can see on the chart that uh, we, we found that other than size one, uh, other than uh, level one or two, uh, after that, our, we had a slow but overall trend of uh, increasing uh, compression ratio size, increasing compression ratio as we increase the level. Next slide. Okay. And then, so while the last slide was talking about the ratio that we found as we increase the level, this slide is about the write time and the read time that we get as we, as we uh, modify the compression level. Uh, so the, basically the charts on this slide are showing the, the write time and the read time for each level. And then you can see here that uh, the write time increases as the compression level goes up from one to 22, we see the write time is actually increasing quite significantly. But on the other side, the read time is staying constant. So this is in line with the numbers that Facebook published. And we found that this is the same with our own data. And this kind of gives us 
uh, an idea, basically using this, these two tables as well as the, uh, as the chart from the slide above, we can see, we can kind of make a more educated decision on which level we should use. And basically the, uh, the thought process we went through was that since we are doing offline translation for the existing gzip files to z standard files we are okay with uh sacrificing write speed uh because that's going to be an offline one-time rewrite and the read time for these comp higher compressed levels are still remain constant so in the end we chose level 19 to get uh, to get the maximum amount of compression ratio uh and we gave up some write time, which didn't really matter for our use case, and maintained a consistent read time. Uh, next slide. OK, so let's say you want to do what we did, and you want to move from gzip to z standard. The most obvious, straightforward way to do this would be to use a query engine like Spark or Hive. And you would read the data through the query engine and then rewrite the data with the new compression method like z standard. So this is the normal way you do it and it works, but the problem is that it's very slow. If, if basically in the slide, you see all of the steps that need to be done to do it through the query engine. The query engine uh, will basically go through decompression, decoding, disassembly, shuffling, assembly, encoding, and finally recompressing it with your new desired uh, compression algorithm. And this query engine approach might be okay for moderate amounts of data, but for several hundred petabytes of data, uh, like how, like what we have in production at Uber, it's infeasible to do this way of translation within a reasonable amount of time. Next slide. So this slide, so this slide was basically how we uh, improve the process of uh, translating compression. So we saw that there was many steps that were happening to go from one compression algorithm to another, and we tried to improve it. So we looked at the parquet code and we reviewed each of the steps that I mentioned in the last slide. And we thought that we can bypass a lot of the underlying steps like decoding, disassembly, shuffling, uh, et cetera, because our goal is to just translate the compression. So we made code changes within the parquet code itself uh, to skip all these unnecessary steps and just do the bare minimum to decompress and compress to the new compression library. And we found that these changes that we made made uh, the translating compression code five times faster than the existing way you would do it. And we uh, merged this code to upstream Parquet in Parquet 1872. Next slide. Okay, so the so here now I'm going to touch on another mechanism for uh, reducing the storage size, and this is column pruning. So one thing to point out is that many organizations don't have any governance or guidance over uh, adding columns to a data set. And as, a, for, uh, as, the, uh, as time goes by, more and more columns might get added to a data set. And eventually there are gonna be columns that aren't really used anymore, but they take up significant amounts of space. We found that what, one column removal could save several petabytes of space. Uh, so basically that's the idea of this uh, sort of uh, uh, optimization is just removing columns that aren't needed anymore to save space. So how do we decide which column should be removed? We basically combined audit log data with our size estimation data, where the audit log data will give us information on if the column is still used and if it's okay to remove it. And the column size estimated data will tell us how much can we save by removing the data. Uh, by removing the column. And then combining these two pieces of information, we can make a decision on if it's worth it to remove a certain column. Next, next slide. Yeah. So again, similar to the previous example with Z standard, where translating compression is slow, we found that in a similar way, translating and removing unused columns uh, can also be very slow if you use a query engine like Spark or Hive. This is because you have to read the da data re and rewrite those uh, rewrite the data while removing the columns. But the problem is still the same. It's very slow. So if you want to translate hundreds of petabytes of data with, within a reasonable period of time, it's infeasible. So we invented a new high throughput column pruning tool. 
This tool will just do a file copy and skip over the columns that need to be pruned. This is the beautiful and elegant part of column storage, uh, which is that the column data lives together in the file. So if the copy, uh, so if you copy one one column after a column, the tool understands that the uh, the tool understands the file format and can skip over the columns uh, that you do not want that you want to be pruned. So as you can imagine, the speed is very fast because basically we're going at a file copy speed with this tool, uh, which is 10 to 20 times faster than the alternative of reading the data remo and removing the columns and rewriting the data with a query engine. So by doing it this way, we also have the benefit where file counts, permissions, names, these are all pres preserved. Basically this, this file copy strategy of pruning is a very precise strategy. Uh, and we've already saved many petabytes of data so far with this strategy, and which is basically millions of dollars in cost that is saved. Next. Okay, this is our third strategy I'm going to touch on, which is multiple column reordering. We were inspired by this paper to use the idea to sort columns to reduce storage size. The main point of this uh, strategy is that if column values are the same or similar, then the encoding will be more efficient because the deltas between values are zero or very or they're very small. The paper talks about the efficiency of how to implement multiple column ordering. We didn't really follow the paper exactly to execute, but this paper did inspire us. Next slide. So we found that the order of the ordering matters a lot. We did an experiment on one table and one partition with four columns called UUID, timestamp, lat, long, uh, lat, and long. And we sorted them in different orders. And we found that the effective data size was different depending on the order. Eventually, we found uh, an arrangement where we found a 32% drop in the data size from no sorting to four columns being sorted in the right order. Of course, there's a trade off. Uh, I want to note that there's a trade off between ordering columns for storage reduction and query performance. Next slide. And our last initiative for uh, uh, cost efficiency was decimal precision reduction. The idea is that for decimals, uh, we sometimes or often store many decimals of precision. And we found that we can actually reduce some of these least significant bytes to save space without losing any effective uh, accuracy. And this will, uh, so, and doing this sort of precision reduction will also make uh, encodings like run length encoding and uh, delta encoding more effective. Particularly for lat longs, uh, if the decimal is uh, six is already 0 0.1 meters, that should be enough. If, if, if the precision can already uh, determine a location between 0 0.1 meters, that's enough. It, any more decimals after that is, not uh, is not needed since it represents an increasingly small uh, unit of length. So if you wipe, so we can easily wipe out the last two bytes and save a lot of space. Uh, in practice, we found twelve percent drops when we changed the precision from precision eight to precision six. Next slide. And I think Shinli is. All right, uh, thanks, PV and Jianchen. Uh, moving forward, so we will look at per quick column index. So per quick column index is to skip the pages to speed up the queries. So remember in the early slide we talked about in the column row group, we have a lot of column chunk that further divide into pages. Now each page has its mean max, if a query have a filter which doesn't fall into that pages, we can skip that pages. Now this is the overall idea. So we want to do some experiment to see how much performance we can see. And second, Apache Arrow is another technology grow up very fast. So we would like to use it as catch and secondary index. So we want to try it out and see how it help us. Lastly, uh, but now, uh, last but not the least, this one allows the last. So we want to unify the file format to all the Pokemon format. Yep, uh, that's all. And thank you, everybody.